if you have two computers in the same room and you need to get some document from one computer to another, what are your options? Computers back in the 60s had this problem and smart engineers thought, hey, maybe we can just use some cable, some wires to connect the two computers and that way we can exchange information between them. And that was really handy. Not only can you transfer files that way, you can also transfer instructions. So if you have one computer that is maybe kind of weak and the other computer is super powerful, the weak computer can ask the powerful computer to do some calculations and then get the result back using the same wire. So organizations back in the 60s, like government organizations and academia and military organizations, had those networks set up in their buildings. So then someone thought, maybe we should somehow connect those separate networks into a bigger network and call it maybe like an interconnected network or internet. And that's how it started. The web is a bunch of applications, computer programs that run on different computers connected to that network. And they use this network as a means of transportation. So the internet is mostly hardware. You can think of it as the actual physical hardware millions and millions of miles of cables and some networking gear, and of course, computers that run some software. And the web is this virtual layer on top of that. You can think of a postal service that uses the network of roads and highways and traffic lights. That network, that infrastructure is kind of like the internet. And the postal service is kind of like the web. They use the infrastructure, they know how to use it, they cannot exist without it, but if all the roads vanished one day, you can imagine postal service coming up eventually with some other way to deliver mail. So my phone and my laptop and other computers in my apartment are connected to this one Wi-Fi router. So all the computers that are connected to that one router make it a network. So I have a home network which is small, just a bunch of computers. But that network is also connected to this apartment buildings network. And there are about 50 apartments. Each of them, I bet, have some home network. And they are connected into this bigger network by just wires running through the walls. And then this whole building is connected to another network in this neighborhood, which is created by my internet provider. And that network is connected to the city network and into the country network and into the continent network. And even continents are connected by cables, literally running on the seabed, those thick, cool-looking computer cables. And this is kind of amazing. Uh, if you think of it, you can think of like a small ant, like a bug, and you can place it on your Wi-Fi router and it can start walking on the cable and basically follow some maze of cables for millions and millions of miles and get to almost any point on Earth. It can get to your router if it starts in my apartment. So as you can imagine, it's quite a complex system. It takes a lot of engineering and a lot of, lots of maintenance to make it all work. But as a web developer, the good news is that you can mostly ignore it. You can just treat it as this magical portal that somehow appears when you want to make a connection. So when you, as a web developer, are creating an app that connects to the server and gets some information from the server, it goes through this amazingly complicated maze of wires, but you have no idea how it works, and it's good. You just ignore it. You know that somehow that connection is established. And in the end, you have this virtual portal, this tunnel between one computer and another, and you just push some information there and it appears on the other side. And then the server can answer, just push some information back into the portal and it appears here and it's kind of magical. So now that that connection is being taken care of, all we have to think about is two pieces, the client and the server. Now, first thing to understand is that when people say web client or web server, they just mean computer programs. A particular computer programs that just run on someone's computer and they know how to use this internet, they know how to use this transport network to connect and send information in certain predefined format. That's it. 
So the first piece, the first program we look at is the client. And the most common web client that you use every day is a web browser. It's a computer application that runs on your computer, maybe on your phone or tablet, and it knows how to connect to servers, and it knows how to ask them, ask the servers different information, and get the result back, and do something with that result, like show it on your screen, or play it on your speakers, etc. You can think of a web client as a human client in a restaurant, but it's kind of a weird restaurant. First, the waiter in that restaurant is super shy. The waiter will never ask you anything first. He just stands there in the corner and listens, waits for your instructions. While in the restaurant, both you and the waiter obey certain rules, certain set of limitations. First of all, you both speak the same language, say English. And you are expected to both speak the same language to understand each other. You also are expected to say something that makes sense in the context of this restaurant. Uh, if you say some nonsense, like, I want to dance with cats while you watch me, to the waiter, the waiter will probably tell you, I, sorry, I don't understand. I, I cannot do this. But if you follow the rules and you do something by the book and you ask for something that exists on the menu of this restaurant, you will get that thing and the waiter will be happy to successfully give you something that you asked for. The way web client and the web server interact is kind of similar. They do too have this common language and they both need to follow the rules to make this interaction successful. And this set of rules, kind of the language the web client and the web server speak, is called a protocol, an HTTP protocol. And HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which makes sense. A hypertext is this 90s flavored fancy word that just means more than text. It's like super text. Now, don't confuse it with programming languages. Programming languages are the languages that programs are written in, created in. But this is the language that computer programs speak. Now, the simplest scenario is that the client wants to get some file, maybe an HTML web page from the server so that it can show that file to the user, to the actual human. Following the rules of HTTP, we can look up those rules and see that there is a certain instruction, like a verb the client can ask the server. And that verb is get which makes sense because we want to get some information. So the client has to literally say in text, right somewhere, get, and then the name of the thing that it wants, and then this version of the protocol. Now, this is kind of cool. This protocol evolves, as you can imagine, because we need more and more stuff. So this protocol has to change over time, and it did change multiple times. But when the client and the server connect, they don't know, like, are we on the same page? Are we talking the same language? Or this client may be old and it doesn't care about the new additions to the protocol. Maybe the server was kind of old and it doesn't know about new words in this protocol. So they first need to establish this common ground. They need to say, like, we are speaking the same language. So the client, when it makes the requests, it also specifies the version of the language. It say, in this example, I am speaking HTTP version 1.1. So expect me to speak it and please answer using the same language, using the same version of the protocol. It would be kind of cool if people did it in the real life. Like imagine someone coming up to you on the street and saying, yo, I'm speaking New York City slang. And then he asks something that I, I don't know. I, I cannot do that. Anyway, next line, it needs to ask the server what website is it looking for. That server application can actually be responsible for multiple websites or hosts. So when the client asks for a page on some website, it needs to specify what website do you want the page to come from. So that is the second line of this HTTP request. And that's it. So the client kind of writes this on a piece of paper and sends it to that magical portal. And the server 
gets that paper and looks at it and says, okay, cool. So it then tries to facilitate that request. After that is done, it doesn't remember anything. It doesn't store any information. After one instruction is finished, the waiter kind of forgets about you existing. So if you had a glass of wine and you ask the waiter, can I have another glass, please? The waiter will ask like, what? I don't understand. What? Who are you? In this weird restaurant, you have to always specify the complete order, the complete set of instructions, and never assume the waiter remembers anything. Now, the experience we have on the web is quite different. Like, the websites remember us. If everything worked like I just described, you had to, for example, open Gmail and log in, put your username and password, and then see a list of new mails, and then you click on some letter, a new page opens, and you have to log in again. And every time you click any link, every time you do anything, you have to log in because the server actually doesn't remember you. It needs to authorize you. But that's not how it works. It would be mad. They do somehow remember us, but that's not the server. The server actually never remembers that because the protocol doesn't allow that. The protocol doesn't have that in it. And this is what's called a stateless protocol, a protocol without state, without memory, you can think of it. So the web actually works differently and does remember us, but that's just a bunch of tricks that both the server and the client play, but they still use that protocol. The protocol is still quite primitive and kind of dumb. But every time we do anything on the web, uh, thousands of times over a regular day, you just do those interactions and it's just talking with an amnesiac. So that's the client. It starts the interaction, it asks for something, it sometimes tells something, but in this example, it just asks for something and waits. And then it gets the response from the server. And that response might be what it asked for, or it might be saying, I don't have it. You are wrong for asking that. The second piece of the puzzle is the server. When you run a server application, it will say, I'm listening. And it doesn't do anything until that request comes through this magical portal. Maybe sometimes you've seen that you open a website and it loads and loads and nothing happens and it loads and then it says something like timeout, response request timeout error or something like that. So it basically means that your web client, the web browser, made the request and then waited and waited and waited and then, then it thought, okay, I'm not waiting forever. It's not coming back, so I'm bailing. This sometimes happens when the server is maybe overloaded or maybe just unavailable. Maybe that network connection broke somehow, somewhere, some cable broke or something. But a good behaving web server tries to respond all the time. So in this simple example where the client asked for a particular web page on a particular website that is hosted on that web server, the web server gets that request, gets that virtual piece of paper, looks at it and says, okay, this is the file I'm looking for. This is the host, the website. And then this computer program somehow looks into the file system in the simplest scenario and looks for that file. If it finds that file, it kind of copies it, just takes all the content of that file, clicks control C virtually, and then puts it into this new file. And at, at the top of that new file, it puts some additional technical information as specified in the HTTP protocol. So it needs to say, first of all, okay, everything is good. Whatever you asked for, here it is. And actually, the time is this. And add some more technical information that is not relevant at the moment. But this is just something that is possible in the HTTP rule set. And then the server kind of packs this file and pushes it back to the portal. The simplest HTTP uh, web client doesn't do anything. It just gets that file and maybe shows it on the screen as is. And it's not quite useful for the user, for me as a human, because if I ask for a web page, I want to see that web page. I want 
all the letters and buttons and everything on my page so I can look at it and interact with it. And that's what web browsers do. The web browser takes that HTML file and saves it on the disk, on the computer, and then opens it. And you, as a human, see the web page. And it happens like that in just a second. And you see the web page. And when, once you click some link on that web page, this whole thing happens again. This was a short version of how it works. Now, in the course and in the ebook, you actually are about to start building, at this point, your own server and then your own web client and making that request and seeing all the details and actually seeing this fundamental mechanic of how the web works. And once you understand that, you have laid the foundation of your future web development practice because this is fundamentally how everything works. It gets more complicated, of course, because we need more features and we need more different types of interactions. But at the core, it's always like this. It's just a client sending some text through the portal and getting some text back and doing something with it. And thank you. That's it. <laughs>